Welcome to the How Soccer Explains Leadership Podcast, where we explore leadership principles through the lens of the beautiful game. Welcome back to How Soccer Explains Leadership. This is Phil Dark. I'm your host for this show. Uh, hopefully, this isn't your first time. Hopefully, you've listened to a lot of our episodes. But if it is your first time, welcome. I uh, look forward to hearing back from you what you're learning. Everyone listening, I really look forward to hearing you engaging this conversation, not just listening in, but being a part of it. So with that, if you haven't done so already, join a Facebook group that we have. You can click that link in the show notes if you haven't joined that already. If you have, you know that we do have conversation there. Great place to let us know any guests that you have that you might want to introduce to us so that we can get them on this show. Also, rate and review the show if you haven't done so already. But again, great guest we have again today as as usual. I've learned from this guy already. We met a few weeks ago because he also does a podcast. He is the trainer of High Five Adventure Learning Center and host of the Vertical Playpen podcast. His name is Phil Brown. He is from the UK, Ipswich, England to be specific. Phil, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Phil. Absolutely. You know, you're going to have a lot of Phil today. So folks, get ready for it. But not surprising to you. I'm, I'm guessing that not a lot of people know who you are listening to this. If they do, I'm glad about that because, you know, you're a pretty cool guy who's got a lot of good things to learn from. I know I have already. But can you just share, as we get started, just share your story a little bit about what you do, your podcast, how you develop your passion for soccer and leadership? Yeah, sure. Thanks. So originally I'm from a town called Ipswich. Soccer fans out there, Ipswich Town Football Club is the team that I support. They're currently unfortunately in League One and they're having a rough rough go of things, but that's where I'm originally from. I looked at trying to become a teacher, an English teacher. That was where my vocation was heading. That's where my career was heading. And at one stage during college, found out that I could work at a summer camp in the States. And so I thought, well, this could be good for me. This could be a way that I could add stuff to the resume of saying I worked with kids from a different population, different countries that will help. And then I entered into this world of working with youth and adults in team development stuff just through that summer camp experience. They had a challenge course, a ropes course, and I was introduced to that world and realized that, wow, this is so much more fun teaching kids how to be better human beings and better leaders and better participants in their community than it was to try to teach Shakespeare, you know, and I, what I was able to do is take all of my training in the education world and bring that to doing team development work. And I was very, very fortunate that the camp that I ended up in, in New York state ended up having an an outdoor education program year round. So they sponsored me to extend my visa. And then from that point, I grew into this position, which I ended up creating at the organization called the challenge course coordinator or team development coordinator. And I ended up being sent to High Five to do my formal training. They do training around challenge course operation, but also team and leadership development facilitation. So I was able to go to many trainings and that was how I found out, actually, this is a career. I had no idea that I could work in this field in the UK. Possibly it is a career. I haven't, I still do not know, but here I was able to fall into this outdoor red world and I was very, very fortunate to do so. Had lots of training along the way. And then myself and my wife, we met at the summer camp. We worked at the summer camp. We lived at the summer camp. We got married at the summer camp, very summer camp. Decided we needed to grow what we wanted to grow our family and we couldn't stay in that world for that much longer. And a job opened up at High Five as a trainer. And I jumped on the chance to work at an org that meant a lot to me and was doing great stuff with communities all around the northeast of the US. And now I've been there coming up on six years. So it's been very fortuitous how I ended up finding my way here. In terms of the podcast, I realized that when I was starting out in this industry of adventure and experiential education, that's what we're umbrella termed in, I had no idea it existed. I had no idea it existed when I was in England. I had no idea it existed even when I came to the States and I was like, what is this? You can go to colleges and get degrees in this. I had no idea you could do that. And so the point of the podcast was I wanted there to be an avenue, a way for us to spread the word of experiential and ed- adventure education. Since I had no idea it existed, no doubt other people don't know it exists. People listen to this may be like, what? This is a thing he does for a living. So I we created the podcast. Originally, it was just myself and some of the staff at High Five talking about how we started at High Five and then 
realized that people were interested and we got listeners and people were asking questions and submitting questions. And now it's become, we've been doing it for two years and yeah, it's got a good listener base and welcome other people to jump in and take a listen to some of the episodes. I interviewed a bunch of people. I interviewed Phil who, who's host of this podcast. And I'm realizing that so many people are connected to experiential education, which essentially in its very, very basic term is learning from your experiences. Wow. Yeah. That you've probably everyone right, has, right. has learned from their experiences, but there is studies, there are journal articles, there is people that do this for a career and teach this. And I just get passionate and excited about the idea of making better human beings, but also being able to introduce people to this idea that they already probably are aware of sort of related sometimes to a comedian who goes up on stage and says obvious jokes and everyone's like, wow, it's so relatable. That's kind yeah. of how the industry feels like to me. Once people realize it, they realize, wow, I've probably done that. You know, you think of a very simple description, simple example would be like you're walking down the, as a kid, you're walking and you trip over something like a root on the ground. If you're outside, you realize now you probably should keep your feet up. That in itself is experiential learning. You did something, you had something happen to you and you had a learning outcome afterwards and that cultivates and shapes the way you continue life. So it's a, it's an exciting thing in terms of soccer. You know, I've referenced this in a, another conversation with Phil that, and people are probably aware of this in England, it's pretty much our only sport. There are a few, but you're raised on soccer you're raised on football it's a part of your being in nearly every single town or at least very close by has a stadium and a team of their own in the town i'm from Ipswich, is would be considered a city in the states i think it's somewhere like three hundred and fifty thousand people there so it's a you know a big area and, and it has a soccer team and you just you're raised and you support them and i also know that norwich city who's an hour north of us are arch rivals you just you it's a component of your your livelihood. So you just don't know anything other than that. And so trying to separate those things is challenging for me because I think that's just a part of growing up. When I came to the States and I've been here now since 2007, around there, so 2008, that it wasn't really publicized in the way it is now. It wasn't on the TV. It wasn't as seen. And I'm so thankful that NBC and NBCSN have started showing some of the games and now I can watch a lot of the Premier League games. And so I'm immersed back in it. And so that's, that's really exciting. Yeah. It's, it's funny you say that because if you're here in the U S listening to this and you're, you've never been to England to experience football in England, it's nothing like anything we have in the U S it's just really isn't. We can talk about the Oakland Raiders when they were in Oakland as oh uh, well, they're rabid fans, but you don't, you don't know what you're talking about until you, it, like you said, it's just who you are. And the thought of you being in and from Ipswich and not being a supporter of Ipswich is just crazy. Like you just wouldn't see it, right? Oh, yeah. No, if you if you saw anyone wearing any other jersey, it'd be like, yeah. this, what is the tourist doing here? Clearly, they're the tourist. Yeah, and especially here. I'm out in California. So California, it's like you... It's a free for all of who you support, you know, and that's just that's something that's that's really cool. But we're not going to focus on that. But that is something like you said, it's just part of who you are. It's just part of your blood. You are a football supporter. You are an Ipswich supporter. And and you've been learning from the game your whole life, which is really cool. A few episodes ago, we had Mark Peace. If you haven't listened to that episode, I strongly encourage you to do so. It's about his experience. He's a pastor, yes, but he's also a lifelong lead supporter. And he talked about Marco Bielsa and the impact he has had, not just on that team and club, but on the community and the leadership lessons we can learn from that. But the other thing that's really cool about you and what you do is, as you said, it's experiential learning. And, you know, folks, if there's one thing I want you to learn from this podcast, and one of the reasons I started it is to learn from your experiences, learn from your experience in the game of football, but also learn from learn interdisciplinary, you know, have interdisciplinary learning. I don't know exactly when this is going to air, but we're going to have a guy that I'm going to interview soon who's a field hockey referee, and, and we're going to learn from him. He also has written a book on baseball, and he was a USA Today journalist. So these are things like we can learn from other disciplines. Hopefully we have people listening in who are businessmen and women in your parenting, in your marriage. These are things that we can take these principles as you do with the adventure sports through ropes courses, through mountain biking, through whatever, whitewater rafting, right? Like we can learn life lessons from these things. I, I say that Hopefully, I don't have to make the connection. Hopefully, especially as we do more of this, you can see that this is there is a method to the madness. 
you know, I, I believe that what you do is exactly what we're talking about doing on this show. What we hope to encourage people to do is literally in every area of your life to think about, okay, here's a lesson. How can I apply this to other areas of my life? And how can I really use this? So with that, how do you use the lessons you've learned from football in your country, right? Now you're in the U.S., so we'll, we'll use soccer for the purposes of this interview just because we are an American podcast, but you know what I'm talking about if I slip into football. But uh, you learn from soccer and your leadership and in, in your training development work that you do today. Yeah, I would say the, the great thing I think about soccer in terms of the difference between that and other sports is that there doesn't necessarily have to be these individualized people on the team who create the winning structure of the team it, it's it's much more focused on a collective community and i think that that's something that in in england they also have in a big way as well is because that team is a part of the community in the community so in uh, structured around the team that you do have that connection formed with the players and the staff to have the insignia of your team on your badge and say that you work for them they work for you. It, it has this kind of feel of uh, symbioticness that I some I don't sometimes sense from teams in this country and other sports where it's more fan based idolization of people. It's more a community, everyone on the same level. I think that where this leads into the work that I do, we have a product. We also create team development products, and one of the products we create is a deck of cards called Ubuntu. People can't see that but it's sitting right behind me but it's ubuntu u-b-u-n-t-u and the essential phrase of it what that means it's part of the bantu dialect in africa and it essentially breaks down to be i am because we are i am because we are which talks about that sense of community it was coined very famously by nelson mandela and desmond archbishop desmond tutu to talk about around apartheid about the community of south africa getting together to work together to raise the bar of what was going on there. And that had to come from every component. It's not an individual. It doesn't require an individual. It requires all people. So we utilize this deck of cards, which you can find on our website, but there's a lot of activities that go with us. But we use that phrasing of Ubuntu to represent that we're all part of the exact same team, no bigger than anyone else. And I think that that's something that I know in soccer teams is that when let's say a, a captain comes up and talks about the team or or a coach comes up and talks about the team post game they might highlight individuals but really they're talking about the larger component of the team how was the quality of the team's morale how was their energy what was their fight like what was their drive rather than say this person saved us mm -hmm. because and even when you see journalists ask that question of them they often recoil back and say well actually it's a team effort and I think that that really sums up what I think that soccer brings that's, that I think other teams could learn from. Other sports could also learn from that this mindset. But going back to Ubuntu, in relevance to American sports, the Boston Celtics basketball team in this area, when they were coached by Doc Rivers, they used to put their hands in the middle and chant before every game. And that word that they would chant would be Ubuntu. So going back to this idea, they were trying to get this mindset that we're all component of this team. We're not a product of an individual, we're a product of the whole team. And I think that that's something that we continuously work on when we're doing leadership development, be that with youth programming, with adult corporate groups, with sports teams. We do, High Five does work with NHL teams. So we do professional sports, but mainly in the hockey area of sport. But whenever we're working with any of these teams, we're always talking about the connection of the team. In experiential education, there's a term that gets used, I think sometimes banded around too often, but it's connection before content. And it essentially means that we should be focusing on how connected people are before we ever get into the nitty gritty detail stuff, rather than talking about like, oh, we don't trust each other or we're not communicating, all those things. Forget that for a moment. Let's just focus on are you connected? Because you're more likely to be able to have good conversations and important conversations with people that you're connected with than people you don't know. So that connection is is key. And so when you end up having that connection, you sort of get rid of you. You cut away from the ego of the individual and you start realizing that we're all a part of the team. And so that's something that I would say we consistently use at High Five in terms of our leadership development stuff, which I think is a good parallel between soccer leadership, because I think that it doesn't often come necessarily from individuals. It comes from the group working together. And I would even say as well, I think that 
soccer coaches are more facilitators. And that's a term that we often use in our industry to talk about what we do. Facilitation meaning to make easy. The, the, those coaches facilitate the growth of their team rather than, once again, ordering people around and telling them what you need to do. And often those people, you talked about Bielsa as an example of, of a coach that does that well. If you've ever watched a Leeds game, you'll know he sits on his little Bielsa bucket, but he's very silent. You don't get him animated on the sidelines yelling at the team because what he's done is he's cultivated, he, his team knows what to do and he can sit back and he can then observe and then he can watch and he gives and empowers the team members to make the decisions for themselves. So lots of different components. I think that there are parallels and great lessons from watching teams operate that can be brought into any kind of environment. Yeah, you said a couple things there. The first is, you know, I'll, I'll hit the, the last thing you said first, which is great leaders really cultivate that environment that everyone can flourish in. It's not so much you're telling people what to do. No, you're cultivating this environment for them to grow. You're basically a gardener to be able to till that soil so that these different plants, these different types of people can all flourish within this garden, so to speak. And so that's what a great coach will do in a great team. The other thing you talked about there really is the idea of soccer being a weak league sport. Malcolm Gladwell had a great podcast on this talking about basketball being a strong link sport, meaning that a great player can take over a game. Look at LeBron James, for example. He can he can take over a game even if he's the only dude on the team who's a rock star, so to speak. But if you have that one rock star on a soccer team, it's not going to... You have one, you know, one Messi, and he's playing with a bunch of players who can't play. Those other players will be exposed. Your weakest link will be exposed by another great team or another really good team, for that matter. Mm -hmm. But the other thing with that is... To have this team, because it's a weak link sport, you not only need to have strong links, but you need to be connected. You need to be one unit. And the only way that's going to happen is by actually having that leader cultivating that environment, but also having players that believe in that and that are actually seeing it as we are a team. We love each other. We care about each other. And for that culture to spread into the community, I think of one of my old coaches, he played for West Ham United, and we're going to have him on the show at some point in the future. Clyde Best is his name, and he was an amazing, amazing player for West Ham back in the 70s. And I, in the 90s, early 90s, I called him and said, hey, I'm going to be over in, in London. Any chance you can get me tickets? He says, oh, yeah, let me call up my old friends. Well, his old friends ran the pub across the street from the stadium, and they were just the team would go there after the game. And so they were hanging out. And these are guys that he still keeps in touch with. They were buddies. I just assumed they were old players. And I talked to him the other day and I said, was it, were those old players with you? Like, and he says, no, they were just my friends. They own the, they own the pub. We would all go there and hang out. So that's that idea is just so foreign. The thought of a team going after the game here in the U.S. to the pub across the street or the bar across the street is just crazy talk. They'd be mobbed. Yeah. And so that's something that is, you know, again, that's just kind of a cool little thing. I don't know the, the life lesson with that, except to say, if we as organizational leaders can bring our customer base to bring our people, to bring our team into a feeling of, like you said, family into a feeling of we are one, we are part of this. How much stronger is that? So what are your thoughts on all that stuff? Yeah, I think that something that struck into my head, the was the sense of that community that they're connected with the people that are in the pub and that kind of stuff. I think that something that England has or soccer has that I think is really helpful is that they have this academy grassroots system where they're really bringing in cultivating kids from a younger age who were also who are homegrown in that area. So I went to a high school and they had friends who got into the academy team. And then you see them grow and sometimes they make it, sometimes they don't. But a lot of times you'll get these players that end up playing for the teams who were actually a part of the community to begin with. So you can sense there's a huge amount of investment from the local community around seeing an individual who come from them. Rather than, I think that sometimes the States is an issue with size, to be honest. It's just, it's so big. And so you can't really have the connection as much to the players as you would like to have. But you can see in England that you can have this real deep connection with people who are really connected to the team and the coaching staff and other other individuals. I was interviewing a guy who's actually from my hometown 
And he said when he was growing up, he would walk down the street and he'd walk past Bobby Robson. Now, Bobby Robson was the coach of Ipswich back in our heyday when we were great. He was also the coach of the national team, England team, when they were doing so wonderfully well as well. So he would walk down the street and he would say, hey, hey, Mr. Robson. And Bobby Robson would say, hey, Andrew, like he'd know the name. Like just it was a there wasn't this big like we are rush to get autographs and security and all of that kind of sense of isolation i think that creates from that as an example i've worked with a couple of nhl teams and whenever we've worked with those teams we sign ndas we have to hand over like cell phones we have to have security represented we have to keep the location of where we're going secret that's an odd thing, really, when you when you really an, analyze yeah. it. Like the individuals, the players, I remember we were in a one hotel and they were, it was a shared hotel and there were other people in the hotel. We'd have to sneak them out the back. They've had their hoods up. And I think like that is what a life that must be to lead that life. But when, you, when you're unable to really have that deep connection to the community, there's something lost there, I would assume. And there, how do you cultivate that passion when you don't have that deep connection? We go back to the connection piece. That's interesting. It, it may, I don't know why it made me think of that. Actually, I do know why, because it's a similar idea. This idea of the celebrity culture in the U.S., I think, really throws us for a loop. I was actually just talking to somebody about it this morning about our platform, right? How much talk do we have of platform building in our world is in the U.S., really? I don't know how, how big it is over in Europe, but how many followers do you have? How many friends do you have on Facebook? How many, even the words that are used are relational words. They're leadership words, but they're not really... You're not leading necessarily. You're just a quote unquote influencer. But the reality is, what is your real platform? Your real platform are the people that you know and love and that know and love you. I mean, like you're really, really impacting deeply into their lives. You may be a nugget of something that they remember, but the reality is people that I, if you're on this podcast, I'm, you're going to learn some stuff from this. But if I've disappeared for six months, you wouldn't really miss me. I don't think. You know, hopefully that's hopefully you have people in your life that if they were to disappear for even three days, you'd say, what's going on with them? How are they really doing those? That's really your plat, like your true platform at the end of the day. But we've established this celebrity culture where if a hockey player on the Boston Bruins says something, we go, ooh, I must listen to that. Right. Mm -hmm. Where LeBron James is now a political figure. What? Why? He's a great basketball player, but why would we listen to him on these very, very important global issues? And, and so, and like you said, they need protection. They need all this other stuff because we have the celebrity culture, because we put them on a pedestal. Contrast that to what you made me think of. I was in The Hague with my, one of my really good friends and we were walking around and he points over to this guy riding a bike. He goes, that's the prime minister. And he was riding a bike because he rides his bike to work. And he yeah. locks his bike outside the government building and he walks in and it's just the prime minister. It's no big deal. No mm -hmm. big, huge entourage, no secret service, no anything. And you go, what are we missing? Right. I mean, like from a leadership perspective, you go, are you putting yourself on a pedestal as the leader? Or are you truly seeing yourself as a gardener who is a servant leader who is cultivating the flourishing of those around you? And I think it's really hard to be both. Oh, those are almost polar opposite. And I think right. that most of the, if I talk to most people who work in leadership development world, and I immerse myself in that world quite often when I'm traveling to grand conferences, most of the time we're teaching skills that are more servant leader oriented. Mm -hmm. We're not talking, talking about those other things and saying those are, those are things that we should be aiming for. We don't teach you have to be the loudest in the room. You know, like right. you have to be the brightest star in the sky. We don't, we're not saying that stuff. Very often we're talking about the concept of being a servant, facilitating other people's growth. I've worked for people that have really cultivated me and I've deeply respected them. And at the same time, I've worked with people who have ordered me around and I know how I feel about that. Right. Right. Like, so there's the notion of like, if I know as a, as an employee that that's how I feel, why would I want to aspire to be that when I get to a stage of leadership? And it's, yeah, I, I would say most people in, the, in our sphere are not teaching 
the one, but definitely focused on the other, which is like, how can we serve the community that we work with and how can we better cultivate the people around us to be able to grow? And that's what I think that you see in really successful soccer teams. I think you can tell a really great coach by the way that the the players speak about them. So a, a great, just a slight difference in the terminology. If someone says the coach versus saying my coach, very different, but listen to them describe, talk about their coach or whoever it is. And if they say our, our coach or my coach, they use some kind of some kind of ownership over it. Then you can tell that they respect them. If they say the coach, they don't really respect them. They just know that, that person has a title. And so when I'm thinking about trying to cultivate leaders, I, I want, I want to people to realize that you want to get to a point where you are a part of them, that, that you're not telling them what to do you're not above them the pyramid should flip and the totem pole should flip but whatever you want to phrase it it should be a point where you're referred to as their leader rather than the leader and i i think that, that slight distinction difference is very interesting when you talk to people and i found that the case when i've interviewed people who worked if i'm going into work of a corporate group and i want to get a scale of what's going on in the department that i'm working with i might ask them questions that will sort of lead that in and they won't know i'm doing that but i said a little bit of detective work on my end because if the leader's in the room when i'm trying to have a discussion they're not going to be honest so i i want them to have a little bit more honesty about stuff so just those small things about the way that they term They'll give you information, and the difference between thee and my is very striking, I found. It's massive. I mean, it's everything, right? And and that goes to, I think that a lot of that goes to personality of the coaches. It goes to task-focused versus people-focused. It goes to the culture. It goes to, are you a servant leader, or are you have you learned to be a transactional leader? That just transactional leader versus relational leader. Joe Ehrman in Inside Out Coaching talks about that very deeply. It's a great book on that, but what you find is a lot of coaches think we need to be transactional because this is a results-based business. And even I saw Alex Ferguson talk about the other day, talking about with SoulSky, well, hey, it's a results-based business business at the end of the day. But you're going to get the best results when you are a leader they want to play for, when you are the relational leader. So yes, it it can be a both-and, and it needs to be a both-and, I think, for long-term success because you you put that up against a Mourinho, for instance. I don't think anyone would accuse Mourinho about being a relational leader. He's very much a transactional leader. So what does he get? He gets short-term results. Mm -hmm. And, you know, two, three years, virtually every club he's been a part of has imploded. And it's because I think, you know, in my completely uneducated view, and if, if Jose, you want to come on the show and, and, and tell me I'm wrong, I'd love to have that conversation because I do want to know the method behind the madness. But, you know, to say that he is not cultivating an environment for all of his players to flourish, I think some of the players flourish and some completely implode or explode. And because of that, the locker room is a mess. Versus what I saw just the other day, and it's interesting because you don't hear about a lot of this, you don't see a lot of this, but with Solskjaer on Man United, he said in a quote I just saw, talking about how he has one-on-one conversation with his players to really see how they're doing personally, how their marriage is going, how their, how their kids are doing, how they're doing. And, you know, to really, he says, you know, we walk, if, if they're struggling to get in the team, we have these conversations one-on-one. That's a totally different approach from a relational folk. That takes a lot of time, energy, effort that isn't X's and O's. And I think that's a great leadership yeah. lesson all around the room. And I think that you have to build that into your normal work to work day. Don't assume that these are additional parts. Like if you're a leader, that's the crucial. These are crucial steps. These aren't like parts that you add in if you have time or I didn't have time to do that. I didn't have time to do that. No, that should be a part of your day to day. Because the last time we spoke, Phil, I remember us saying like, man, you know, we're having a rough go at it. So congrats at the moment. You're number one. So it's like <laughs> we're milking on this. it. We're milking it right now. Just, yeah. just you know, <laughs> don't jinx it. But but to, we also talked about how Paul Pogba really has disappeared. He's just all about himself. What change he's made in the last few weeks. And I think that the, in every discussion I've seen, it's been exactly what you've suggested. It's been relation focused. Actually, Solskjaer is actually talking to him actually having conversations with him and learning about his players. And that does take time. It's also not a quick fix. Mm-hmm. I'm not a massive fan of the, the the coaches in and coaches out after like three months because they didn't win. It's like, give them some time to build the relationship a little bit. Have Give them some time. But 
as an example of like spending the time, our executive director at our org, when we were back in our offices, he would purposely every single morning, the first hour of his day was spent going office to office and saying, how are you? Just checking in every day. Yeah. Now, sometimes you, you, you were like, oh, God, he's coming quick. I was trying to have a meeting or something. You were trying to do something. But from a perspective of knowing that your leader has your back and really cares about you, he knew every single thing about all of his employees' life and everything. You know, like when my daughter turned five, he, get, he sent me a text. He's not on social media. He just knows those things or he's written them down somewhere or he's taken the extra step to learn. I would go above and beyond for him because he's gone above and beyond for me in these moments and has taken maybe an hour out of his day. But when I'm talking to leaders and teaching them about this stuff, I was with a corporate group and we were doing a session on communication we would throw in activities that's the how we use stuff we use activities as an example or uh, of rather real life scenario and try to make it entertaining but they were saying at the end wow phil that was so much sun i wish we could do this more often and i just said why can't you like is there a reason you can't now granted i'm just facilitating some things you can't do but spending the time to connect as an example, we're, we're sort of doing, not doing this as well with the Zoom. Zoom is great, right? Because we can have lots of interactions with lots of people. But how often do you actually schedule a meeting just to chat, not to have a meet, have an agenda? Like we're seeing each other a lot, but we're always focused on an agenda. So mm -hmm. spending the time out of your day just to connect. Our organization, what we do is we do coffee partners. And every single week we get assigned a new staff, a different staff member who's going to be our coffee partner. And once or twice a week, we have coffee with them virtually. And it's but it's planned. It's planned and it's intentional so that you know that it's part of work, putting air quotes there, but you don't feel like you're, you're skipping out on something. It's an intentional part of the work day, just like it's an intentional part of, I think, a leader's job to really cultivate connection with the people they work with. Yeah, that's, that's just so good. I can't emphasize that enough, folks. If again, that, that last little bit there, just talking about connection first. And, and that, that goes to really the way you guys train leadership. Going back to what we talked about early on, just you with High Five. And you guys have three things. Connect, empower, lead. That are your the focus of what you teach and train. And it doesn't say lead, connect, empower, or empower, connect, lead. It's connect first. But can you just speak to the other two and what that looks like in, as you're training? Obviously, in a in a nutshell, we don't have the time for the full training, but and we'll get all the information on the show notes as far as how to connect with you and be mm -hmm. able to be able to learn more about High Five. But can you just give that uh, nutshell and then really how it applies to what we're talking about here? Yeah. So in terms of that's like essentially our umbrella term it fits into every department for us connect and power lead we try to focus everything we can around that there's also an additional part after the lead which is be the example which i think is another important role model component to it as well but how do we represent ourselves but if i take it into the terms when we're working with sports teams the first thing obviously is focusing on the connection the next is to really empower the team to make the decisions about how things flow. What I really love, this is an analogy that was sh uh, shared with me recently, that as a facilitator, a team development, leadership development facilitator, this is my essential job. I climb into the bus, I turn the engine off, and then get off the bus, let all the players go onto the bus. They determine where they're going, who's steering, what speed they're going at, their destination, every component of All I do is turn the engine on. So that's that empowerment piece. There's uh, a phrase that you you know, Ted talks sage on the stage, right? Like this person is sage on the stage. What I like, and I think this is a little cheesy, but I, I do like this, is I heard someone refer to us as guides on the side. Instead <laughs> of sages on the stage, guide on the side, which essentially is that giving the over the power. It's not about me. I don't, the end result shouldn't be, did Phil have a great day? <laughs> like that's a bad end of the program. But I've got them to connect. I've then handed over stuff to them. So I've maybe given them prompts or discussions, let them figure out, cultivate what their needs are and all that kind of stuff. And then we talk about who in the group are the leaders, who steps up and represents and leads. And we have to be able to give them the empowerment, give them the choice. In adventure education, there's a term called challenge by choice. The essential meaning is that I allow people to choose their own level of challenge when it comes to, if we were talking about a ropes course, climbing really high or going on the zip or all that kind of stuff but it also represents to how who wants to speak up and who wants to take what roles on but i think that that empowerment is really crucial if you want to have leaders rather than you picking and assigning people 
I, I really dislike, I've seen this a lot in meetings where people are assigned who, who's going to introduce what, or you're going to play this next, or I'm going to pick names. You're looking across the grid or Zoom and say, okay, you're going to, Phil, I need you to say this start point. Like, you haven't really empowered. You've just told someone to do something. So you want to give them the opportunity to empower themselves. And there has to be some sort of choice there. So we have that connection. We have the empowerment. And then the end point is leadership. That's sort of like the result. If we get to a point where we've done those first two really, really well, then we can have the a leader who's really, really well in charge of their role. And the other thing I would say on leadership in general is that I think that they're either it's society based or whatever. I think that we have misrepresented what the word leadership should mean. I think that externally people might hear the word leader and assume it's the person on top, the person doing all the order and around and all that kind of stuff. I, I think that, and this, this is my stance and also high five stance that every single person has leadership quality, has the ability to stand up and be a leader. And it doesn't mean the person making decisions. There's this, it was a video going around for a while. And it was this notion of the second leader, which I really, really like this notion. The video showed like a dance party or a festival or something, a big field, like a Glastonbury, if people are aware of what that is. And there was someone, there was music in the background, and there was just someone who obviously had too much to drink, but they were just dancing in the middle, like on their own. And you could hear the chat, and there was someone filming it, and there was a lot of laughter, like everyone laughing at this person in the middle. And then someone else joined in to because they empathized in some way they first felt this person was vulnerable and they wanted to join in and support them they joined in as soon as that second leader as soon as that second person went over and did it more people joined and it became a big celebration dance mm -hmm. and so i think of that in terms of leadership not just being that person who speaks out but also those people who support everyone else so as an example if you're working with a group and someone speaks out against an injustice they're experiencing that puts them in a vulnerable position. Others might look at that and go, oh, why did they just say that? That's embarrassing. Don't say it. But all it's going to take is one other person to step in. And that creates that little bit of movement, little bit of uh, validation on the concept. And that, that second person is what I see as, as good leadership, has demonstrated empathy, understanding for what's going on, realized there was a need for them to step up and support. And they stepped up to support somebody else. They didn't do it for their own actions. They did it for somebody else. And I do a workshop called The Power of Play. And in this, I talk about the science and the neurochemicals in play. And there are essentially four chemicals that, four neurochemicals that occur when you're experiencing play and with a group and they make you feel joy. There's endorphins, there's dopamine, there's serotonin, there's oxytocin. Well, the one I focus on is serotonin. We ref I refer to it as the leadership chemical. And what happens is when you see someone else do a good deed, you get a boost if you of serotonin. The person that did the good deed gets the boost, but anyone who witnessed the good deed also gets the boost. So when you see someone like trip and fall or do something embarrassing, when you see someone go and help them, even if it's not you that helped, you get that boost of serotonin. And I think to tie it back into soccer, that's why people in all sports cheer on teams. When you see your team do well, you get excited. That's all serotonin. That's a boost of this serotonin kicking off all around the stadium. And that's why you hug strangers when you win and you have these elated experiences. And then you are more likely to want to do it again. It's highly addictive, highly repeatable. So that went on off a tangent. I apologize. But <laughs> that's no. what I think of like th those different leadership skills. And I think that that's where I tie it back to that connection and power leadership piece. It's about where do you step up and how do you empower people to be able to step up? Yeah. Again, this podcast is called how soccer explains leadership. So I'm just going to say like right now, if you play soccer, you know, or if you've coached or if you've been a fan, you know that when a team is playing and the fans are behind them and cheering them on, or even if they're booing them and throwing stuff at them, that's motivating them. Mm-hmm. And so you see it now with these teams. The first few games these teams were playing, and still really to today, it was there's a lot of flat play going on. Especially, I think it's home field disadvantage now. Very right. Much. You look at look at Man U as example. They couldn't win at home. First few games of the year, the away form was phenomenal, but at home they'd lose almost every game or tie to teams they should be winning, and they'd lose. Why? Well, I mean, I still, and I've said this before in this, if, if you're listening, anybody related to Manchester United, get the little part that Matt buzzed. I don't care who said it. Football is nothing without fans. Don't have that in the Stretford Inn right behind the goal. 
because they're reminded every time that their fans in the Stratford end aren't cheering them on to score that goal. So that is actually causing the opposite effect where they're not pumped up. They're actually bummed out and it's going to cause them to, you know, so they have to come with even extra boost within to be able to do that. Now, I'm not saying that's why their home form was bad, but you know, it may have something to do with it. They refer to the fans as the 12th player on the field, right? Right. Like it's, it's an essential core component of the field. And without those people, you don't have that boost. And you, yeah, absolutely. You don't have that drive to succeed. I think there was a study on, you see this a lot in track and field. You, when you've got like the long jumpers and the triple jumpers, they do like, they get the, the clapping going with the, with the crowd. Now that's why it's, it, people assume sometimes that's rhythm based. That helps them get on rhythm. Like there's a rhythm to it. Like, these people have practiced, they're trained athletes. They know how to run and, and land on the right board at the same time. But the point of it is when they have those people, they often get personal best. That's why when you see these things, they're like, how are the kids constantly getting personal best at these world championships? Well, it's because when they train, they can't get there. And then they have the crowd and suddenly they get there. So it's the same thing in in soccer. When you lose that connection to having people cheer you, then you don't have the drive and the desire. And, you you know, who cares? No one's watching. And they forget sometimes the cameras are on them, you know. And put that into a business setting. Put that into a nonprofit setting. Put that into your family. Put that into your marriage, right? You want to get the best out of each other and courage. As we say in our house, choose joy. When you choose joy, it not only helps you, it helps the whole family. When you have that gratitude, I, you know, the idea of just think of three things and write them down of every day that you're grateful for. Proven studies on all those things. But as you said, it also helps everyone around you. And I love that guide on the side concept because as we talked about earlier, that gardener idea, that cultivating the environment, if that's what you're really looking to do, think about that. How many gardeners do you know? But how many gardens have you seen that are like, that is beautiful. As a coach, as a leader, you want to be that person that they're looking at your organization, whether it's a soccer team or a nonprofit, and they're saying, that's some amazing work going on out there. That's an amazing team going on. And you as the coach may or may not be known. I mean, you know the big name managers, but you don't know a lot of these little smaller managers who are doing pretty amazing things with teams that have less than... I mean, how many people would know Bielsa if the Amazon Prime wasn't... A lot of soccer fans will, but you wouldn't know. You wouldn't have that knowledge if the all or or the not all or nothing, but the take us home didn't happen. So those are things that I look at and go... Leaders, if you're in it for yourself and your image and your glory, I hesitate, you know, I hesitate to call you a leader. You're, you're just a, a guy who wants to do stuff for you. But if you're, if you're there to really build others up, to really be that servant leader, which I think we have such a leadership void and we call so many things leaders. When you call everything a leader, it's kind of ceases to be a leader, ceases to mean something. Yep. I love what you said to you. And I say it all the time. Everybody is leading someone. And when you see yourself as a leader, you will handle yourselves differently. You will just really carry yourselves differently. And hopefully you will see it as that servant leadership. Some people do it easier than others. So anyway, those are, I love the tangents. You, they weren't really tangents. They're all absolutely related to this. And it's what I love about doing what we're doing. I mean, what you're doing, what we're talking about here. It's why I love coaching to be able to, I mean, what should bring you the most joy as a coach is to seeing one of your players or as a leader is to see one of your employees or see one of the people in your organization just hitting it out of the park and flourishing at that next level that really the environment and training up everyone to be seeking to build each other up to be the best they can be. I mean, that's what makes weak link sports. That was what makes great teams in weak link sports. Yeah. And you see it in teams where the players, either they stay at the same club because they're invested in the coach and they have that feeling, or sometimes they do move on. And then you hear the players talk about their previous coach in great ways, or you hear the coach talk about how proud they are of that player that moved to a bigger club. You know, going back to my town, Ipswich, we have a great academy. So there are a great number of players that have come through the younger youth academy and played for Ipswich, but Ipswich is a lower league team. You're not going to, it's not a career ending location. And so Tyron Mings, who plays for Tyron Mings, who plays for Aston Villa, Mm -hmm. he grew up in the academy. So what's nice for me is I have a small investment in watching and searing for Aston Villa only because of the player that's there, because I know he's, he's a homegrown 
player from the town I'm from. And he wasn't going to, he's, he had so much talent. He, we knew he would be Premier League. He's not going to stay with us, but you will still have the coach talk about him in great ways, or he'll reference his time at Ipswich as a being a really powerful thing. You don't want to keep hold of these people. If you, if you're a leader, you want them to flourish and grow. We can all probably think of people who we've worked for who trained us so that we would leave. That's not, it's not always great for the organization, but for an individual, that does feel really gratifying that you, they've sent you on professional development. They've allowed you, they've paid for you to do these things and do these courses that might not be particularly related to the work you're doing, but they know that it's all designed to cultivate. And actually, I found in my own personal experience that when your leaders do that, you're actually less likely to leave. I had a lot of professional development paid for when I worked for the YMCA when I was at this camp as a YMCA program. And YMCA is a fantastic organization for really cultivating its staff, and from my opinion. And they would send me to trainings, pay my way to go conferences and all that kind of stuff. But because they had invested in me, I wasn't going to be like, ah, great, thanks for spending all this money on you. Peace, I'm out. You know, like I actually stuck around for probably three, four years longer than I necessarily needed to because of a devotion to them because they devoted themselves to me so i i think that you see that also in in soccer teams you see the players that stay because of the coach even though they've got tons of offers on the table to go to xyz oh real madrid wants this player or whatever they stick because they're invested in the team and the coaching staff and it's less about moving forward and going up going to leeds would be phillips who plays yeah. for Leeds? He when it, when they were in the championship, he got so many Premier League offers because he's young, he's being tapped for England, you know, like lots of potential. But he's stuck with Leeds. There's a reason why he did that, right? That it's not a, just a well, I, my friends. And if you watch that a Take Me Home documentary, you see actually his grandmother and stuff, and like yep. his family are very devoted to that that community. Talks about that community driven stuff again. And he, it was, the decision was obvious to him. I, I could earn triple, quadruple what I'm earning right now, or I could stay at the place that I have passion and really want to cultivate me. And now look where they are. Now they're playing in the Premier League and, this, and now he's playing for England. So yeah. he got what he wanted, but he'd stuck to his guns and stayed exactly where he was, but mainly because of the leadership around him. That's right. Oh, man, we could, we could talk a lot longer about this, but we do have to, to wrap it up and to bring us home. You know, I mean... Leeds did get home and uh, we will get home on this podcast too. But the last couple questions we ask our guests and you've been prepped on it, but how have you used the lessons you've learned directly from soccer in your relationships and other areas of life outside the football pitch and your marriage and your parenting? You know, what, what have you used directly from the game? Like we say, retaliator gets the red, that type idea. What have you learned? Well, I, I'm fortunate in that I've, my daughter is already somewhat a bit of a fan. She's five, but she knows that dad watches soccer on the weekend. So it's become a community part of feel to it. This is a bit of a, I, I know you wouldn't like this. I don't, I'm not a big fan of this either. My, and my mum was sending a Ipswich Town little toddler jersey and she sent it but then she there was like a sale going on somewhere or some little drive and there were like extra jerseys but from random teams right so she threw this other jersey in now my daughter who's five doesn't have less than necessarily understanding which one's more important than other but knew which one she liked the look of more and now <laughs> she wears almost every day an arsenal jersey oh man i know because of the design of their away kit was it's kind of like a bluish greenish kind yep. of like it looks cooler than the straight sure. blue of Ipswich town so she'll wear that all the time but i i would say that you know the idea of one thing that i always used to, and you're, you're i know you coach also was don't be a, a glory hunter don't be a, a bull hog, like these kind of things. And I think that that's an essential part of uh, the team aspect of, of soccer anyway. So she started passing, playing around, we kick the ball to each other, but I'm really in trying to reinforce the idea of passing it. <laughs> We're practicing passing the ball because you can hold the ball yourself. You can, you can try to go to score, but the, the best goals, and I can say that from watching like the stat strategies of the game, the best goals you ever see are the ones that intricate pass play. And it's the unselfishness of the play. That's always exciting. So I just in very basic terms with my daughter, I've been encouraging the idea of passing. And I think that that's translated into the ability for her to share and when she's playing with friends and whatever sport and what she's playing with, there's a there's a passing of it. Don't be a hog. Don't be a glory. It's not all about you. It's it's about that team. So other than the fact that she wears an Arsenal jersey around the house, which is like, 
not that I can't, I don't have anything hatred around them. I'm just like, she has an Ipswich one sitting there. Like, stick on the one that's like from our team, please. I'm fed up with taking the photos of her outside of the Arsenal jersey. People will get the wrong impression. Yeah, you're a better son than I. If my mom would have done that, I probably would have taken it to Goodwill and just dropped it off before my daughter had a chance to, to you know. Well, the thing is, like, she never told me she was sending the thing. The thing. It was like opened up the package. I knew there was a jersey. There were two in there. And I called her and said, <laughs> why did you stick an Arsenal one? Well, it was free. And I was That's like, I don't funny. care if it's yeah. free. It's costing me my mental anguish. Yeah, this is not free, exactly. That's funny. That's Damage funny. to my soul. That's such a great lesson. I mean, that, that idea of, you know, passing to the assist, the helping others, the sharing, the serving, right? I mean, that's something, the, the, the joke in our family, it's not really a joke. My, my, he was seven at the time. He was picking his number for his team. And he said, hey, dad, what's, you know, because he's, he's, as I said, it, takes, it took me five kids to have my peer striker. Mm-hmm. And so he, uh, he says, what, what's, the, what's the number I get if I don't have to pass? You know, <laughs> and I said, well, there's no number, but the nine, I mean, if it's the nine, if, if there's one, then that, that would be it. But, but the thing is though, in all seriousness now, what do I do? Of course, you know, as a dad, who's a coach and who understands life lessons and what we can do to teach him, what am I praising more in any practice in any game is that assist, mm-hmm. right? I mean, yeah, I know he can score. He's got a great shot and whatever. And that's great. Don't get me wrong. But if he has a, you know, he's threading a pass or he's going and has a great cross or if he has a shot, but he's, his teammate has a better one, you know, what a great, th- what a great life lesson there to say the assist is just as important and sometimes more important than the tap in goal, right? You know, creating, passing, like you were saying, those threading those needles. I mean, you're seeing a lot of the Barcelona goals and it comes to mind for good yeah. reason. It's just boom, 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 boom. And then just it's a tap in. Or pass in the corner. You've got, you've got two players playing for Tottenham right now. I know they play for Jose, but like you've yeah. got you've got Kane and Son who mm. are like a dynamic duo right now, and it's because they're constantly setting each other up. That's right. Like Kane has more assists than he ha- anyone else in this in the league at the moment, and so I, I've actually noticed. I don't know if they've always done this, but I've started noticing even when you look on stats on like whatever app you're looking at, they often now always tell assists as much as goals. Which I think is, I, I don't know if it was always the case, but I like seeing like how many assists people get. It's always like now in the stats, but yeah. it's glorified more the fact that someone set someone up as much as someone scoring. And sometimes even the, the, the you know, uh, man of the match award goes to the person that gave the assist instead of the goal scorer. Right. Wow, that, see, I like that. And I yeah. think that those, yeah, c- consistent lesson there. Well, like you said, I mean, it's rare that you see a upper corner shot. I mean, yeah, there are those that are amazing that come out of nowhere off a deflection or off the defender or a bad pass or, you know, Rooney's midfield goal or whatever. Like you see those, but for the most part, the goals are garbage goals, their tap ins, their passes into the corner. They're, they're the result of a great pass that just set them up on a table on a platter so yeah no i love that love that lesson last last question as we wrap it up what have you read watched or listened to recently that has impacted your thinking on how soccer explains life and leadership yeah i've got i wrote down a few things but the first thing that really pops into my head it's a different sport but i know that we've talked about this before was legacy by james kerr which talks about the new zealand all blacks Mm -hmm. they have this phrase which i think is essentially essential for everyone is this notion of sweeping the sheds. Now they call their locker room, the sheds. We talked about like selflessness and community and all those kind of things that we've already talked about. But in that, this team wins the rugby world cup, biggest thing you could win. And the first thing they do is send them straight down to their, their shed and they're asked to do chores, clean up, help clean the, the locker and put all their laundry away. And then they go up and celebrate. So the service piece Mm-hmm. And serving the community is is before the glory that they're going to get. And once they've done that, then they get to then have that glory moment. But I think that those are like like essential skills. And I think they tie into what we've also already talked about relationship to, to soccer with that. Another couple of books that like are somewhat not related to soccer, but I think are really important in the stuff that I've been doing around leadership. One is The Power of Moments by the Heath Brothers, Dan and Chip Heath. Mm-hmm. Just talking about how can you create those small moments. And I think that I think that that's what we reference when your leader comes and checks in and says, how are you doing today? Just those small check-in moments, they stick in people's head more than other stuff. So they're powerful moments that create a very tangible memory that can tie you back to whatever. So that's a great book. And then the other one is The Art of Gathering by Priya Parker, talking about how people collect and how they gather. 
in the way that they work in communities. Something that's referred to, which I've been really like a bit on a, a tear with trying to think of, is the term of toxic positivity. Hmm. And this idea that, and I don't like necessarily the word toxic because it puts on like a that positivity is bad, but the notion is that rather than just focusing on all the things that are good, we also need to understand what is what we also need to work of, work on. And so when you're always talking about everything's awesome, everything's awesome, then that creates this false sense of security that, that then you can't bring up the things that aren't awesome. And so I think about that when you see coaches, it was a perfect one. And I, this is another Man United reference, but Solskjaer, the last game, um, 0-0 against the Liverpool. And they they asked him how he thought his team did and he, they, that he got a point out of it and they're top and everything. He said, no, no, I didn't think we played very well. What a difference that was. Then you go back three months when he was talking and on, constantly talking about the guys are playing really well, they're trying really hard and you knew it wasn't real. People get it when it's not there. So that owning up and not having everything being positive is actually positive. Mm-hmm. One last reference, there was a, it was the social dilemma, Netflix documentary, but there was a phrase at the end and I like this, the critic is the truest optimist because the critic actually wants there to be improvement. Yeah. You don't criticize stuff necessarily just to say it's bad. You're critiquing stuff because you want things to get better because you are, you're passionate about it. You've got some heart in it. You've got some skin in the game. So the yep. critic is the truest optimist. But lots No, of that's that. good. I mean, how many times have you heard that, you know, hate is not the opposite of love. Ap- apathy is the opposite of love, right? I mean, if you don't care... That's the worst thing. But if you're critical of something, it means you actually care about it. You want it to be better. I mean, not everybody, but a good chunk of the time. But you look at Jurgen Klopp. I mean, he's probably the the apex of a great manager, as hard as that is for me to say as a United fan. But right now, there's it's hard to say there's a better manager out there as far as the culture, that development that we're talking about, as far as that that not being that continually toxic positivity guy but being the guy who's building up his players and doing what he needs to do to cultivate that environment. From what I've heard, I'm obviously not over there in Liverpool, but from what I've heard about the guy, that's just exactly what I see out of him. The other thing, if you've listened, folks, to every episode, you know that uh, Graham Roxburgh, the, it was uh, part of season one, but he, he talked about legacy and depth and such a great book. If you haven't picked it up, pick it up. If you haven't listened to that episode, go back and listen to it. He goes into the that Sweep the Sheds, which I absolutely love. Love a lot of that book. Also love just, you know, as you talked about the connection of the team. I don't know that anyone does it better than them and with the Haku be, before every rugby match. Nothing that I've seen compares to that. Anyway... Phil, thank you for being a part of this. Thank you for your example. As you said, be the example. Thank you for the example. I know you've taught me just in the little uh, bit we've had in our relationship. I look forward to the day we can meet in person. Maybe I can come and do one of your one of your experiential learning experiences with my family or, or with an organization yeah. at some point. We've got, a, we've got a, a spring calendar. It's got virtual offerings. So if anyone wants to jump oh. in and see us in virtual, anyone can come to those. Yeah, on that note, how do what is the website? How do people get in touch with you if they want to learn more? Yeah, so uh, you can go to High Five, the number five. So H-I-G-H, high as in opposite of low, fiveadventure.org. And then on our website, you'll find all the trainings and stuff like that. Once again, Vertical Playpen, just search that in in any way you listen to podcasts. And then we're also on Instagram at Vertical Playpen. So other ways you can find. And if you, when you go on the website, you can always just track me down. And if you want to, sure, Phil, you can put somewhere in the description my email. But anyone's feel free to email and contact us. We always answer our phones and happy to answer more questions. Fantastic. Thanks again, Phil. I very much appreciate you. Very much appreciate all that you're doing. Folks out there, as you know, you can reach us at HowSoccerExplainsLeadership.com. You can find out all the information you need to about us there. Thanks again for being a part of this show. I do hope that you take everything that you're learning from this show, everything that you're learning from the resources that we're providing for you, and you're using it to help yourself be a better leader, to help you to cultivate that environment that we talked about here today that will help your players, your employees, your family to flourish. Thanks a lot. Have a great week. 